my backup plan. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. God is good. God bless you all. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your uh, input and uh, sharing your prayer requests and testimonies and so forth. Praise God. Thank you, Suzanne and Peter and Tammy for leading us in worship. And thank the Lord for being here through all of it. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Oh, and by the way, hello to all those out in the ether world. Praise the Lord that are watching us via live stream. Praise the Lord. Appreciate you being part of this, Don and uh, Darlene and others who will remain nameless. Praise the Lord. But we appreciate you tuning in and being a part of the service. And, uh, know that you're important to us as well. Praise the Lord. So, and you know, we've got all these little kids here and I was thinking, you know what happens if you eat too many SpaghettiOs? have a bowel movement. <laughs> you know, I always think of the lions being, you know, the king of the beasts and so forth, but you know why the lion uh, didn't win the race? Because he was racing a cheetah. Cheetah. I've learned, you know, I grew up only about a block from the railroad tracks, which is no big deal in Bondurant. No matter where you lived, you were only a block from the railroad tracks. <laughs> but uh, the truth is, uh, I never trusted trains. I, I realized early on that they have locomotives. <laughs> locomotives. It's crazy. Okay, I think you're good for one more. <laughs> Why did the tomato turn red? He saw the salad dressing. <laughs> that almost hurt me to say, but praise the Lord. All right, praise God. He's good. Amen. And uh, let's, let's get to the Word of God. Amen. I want to start out, Peter, if you will. At, uh, I've got several scriptures here to begin with. So Mark chapter 4, and we'll read verses 13 through 21. We've, we've used these scriptures before, but uh, in... A lot of different uh, messages, but the truth is they're powerful, and uh, I know multiple people right now, family members and others that are going through some serious situations that really demand faith. Mm -hmm. My great-granddaughter's one, and of course, we'll go into all the rest of it. We all got family. We all got people, friends, and so forth that are going through stuff. If they aren't, they will, and if they aren't, they have been, and so... This is basically how we how we respond, amen, to the challenges of life, praise God. And uh, faith is the only way we can move forward in any situation or circumstance, uh, which is why what some of the things I was talking about earlier on, and just simply because... You can only put your faith in what God says. I mean, anything else is just speculation. You know, it's just hope. It's just a, a shot in the dark, or, you know, crapshoot. But if you know what God has said about it, you know you have an answer. You have the results that you're looking for. But there's a part that we play in that, and that is the way we, the way we exercise faith or the way that we show our faith is by being in agreement with whatever God has said about the circumstance or the situation that we're in. In other words, what comes out of our mouth in that situation is going to determine whether we get what God has promised or whether right. we get what the enemy is trying to sell us. Right. Amen? 
So it's critical that we understand that and that we use it. And it's not something that we ever get to a place where now we've arrived. Because every time we're confronted with another situation that's requiring faith, we have to do the same thing again. Yeah. Amen? And it never ends. It never changes. As long as we're in this world, this is the way we've got to operate. This is the way we have to function to be successful, to be everything that God has declared us to be, and to have everything that God has told us that we have. So with that in mind, he said unto them, Know ye not this parable, and how then will you know all parables? The sower soweth the word. So at the basis of everything Jesus taught is the word. Yes. Amen. Everything that he taught comes back to the word of God. Yes. Amen. And how we deal with it. Yes. If you understand this aspect, he says, of my stories or my parables or my uh, relating to you about life, then you'll understand how to deal with any situation or circumstance that might come up in life. Amen. Right. So the sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So the attack really isn't against the person, it's against the word. Yep. And we're talking about stony ground and so forth and so on. But the, the truth is, the way the word works is you keep using the word. You can't just hear it one time and then think that it's going to function and do what it's supposed to do simply because you heard it once. That's what he's talking about. You hear it and go, whoa, praise the Lord, that's great. But if you don't stand in that word, if you don't confess that word, if you don't believe that word, it will get taken from you. The promise will not be yours. It won't be there for you because the only way you can see it manifest is by continuously sowing. In fact, the Bible says we sow the word, but then we, the, we water the word yes. by the word. Yep. We, we sow the promise with the word of God, and then we continue to water that word with the word. In other words, we, we help it to grow and to manifest by continuously giving the word to it. Amen. Yep. And these are they which are sown among thorns. They hear the word and have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So again, we hear the word, we think, oh, praise the Lord, that'll be great. But if it doesn't happen in 24 hours or 48 hours, then we go, well, I guess it doesn't work for me. You know? So we just drop it, and it doesn't produce, and we got what we said we got. Amen? So these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So the worries, the concerns, the issues of life come in and overwhelm what God has said. And we buy into whatever that situation or circumstance is instead of what God has said. And they don't produce. They're unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Now, this is interesting to me. Remember now, the Bible, actually, initially when it was written, it is continuous writing. It, it, it was, there were no paragraphs. There were no punctuation. There weren't uh, ends of sentences or anything. It just was one continuous writing. Yeah. So it's not like he was saying this, and then he changes the subject and starts here. This is all a continuous flow. And so he says all this about the word and, and how it functions. And then he said... And, under them is a candle brought to put brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick this is revelation this is the light of the world amen yes. jesus and so he says i didn't give it to you to stick it under the table or to hide it i gave it to you so that you could broadcast it or bring light into your situation or your circumstance and into the light of others if i give you revelation it's not for you to just ignore it's for you to put it in a place where it has prominence, where it can have an impact. Amen? Yep. All right. So Isaiah now, chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. He laid it upon my mouth, and he said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, 
here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. So he puts, he touches his mouth, he touches his tongue. In other words, he uh, anoints it, right? And then he says, I need somebody to go. And the guy says, I'll go, let me go. And so this is what he says, all right, if you're going, tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See you indeed, but perceive not. That would describe about a large percentage of the Christian church. Got the word, hear it, see it. Don't have a clue what it is he's actually trying to say to us or what he's trying to get accomplished. Amen. All right. Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So this is what the Lord's been dealing with me about for 35, 40 years. <laughs> Praise mm -hmm. the Lord. But it's all come back to me in the last week or so and uh, things that God has been dealing with me because I've been asking about direction. I've been asking for clarity and thought and so on and so forth. And this is kind of the way the Lord has been speaking to me. So if you think about it, this is what the Lord told me the other night. There isn't any resistance if you're not moving. Sometimes it seems like we're just stagnant, you know, that nothing's changing, nothing's happening, that, you know, simply because we don't see into the spirit realm, we're looking at natural things, and it just looks like everything has just come to a screeching halt, and, and if anything is happening, it's negative, it's, it's bad. But the Lord told me that <clears throat> if you're not moving, everything's cool. It's only when you're actually making forward progress that there is resistance felt. Mm -hmm. That's when you know, it's just like the word, Immediately, when you begin to move in the Word of God, resistance comes, or the enemy comes to steal that Word, yeah. amen, to steal your, your sense of uh, productivity or that you're, being, that you're functioning in the way that you're supposed to function. Yeah. But God says that even though there's going to be times of stress, there's going to be times of disappointment, there's going to be times of pressure, the vision or the promise has to come to pass. The devil wants us to get the focus on the pressure, yep. amen, on the, on the dysfunction, amen, on the, on the disappointment, amen, yep. right? Yep. See, it's not a matter of whether it's going to be fulfilled. It's a matter of whether we're going to be true to what God has promised in the midst of the challenges because that's the only way God's going to bring it to pass, mm -hmm. Amen. So it's not a question of whether it will happen. It's a whether or not I'm going to be faithful to what he has said so that it can happen. Right. Praise the Lord. Yes. There's one, one word that describes the essence of God, and that word is faithfulness. Yes. And that's because he's true to what he decided to accomplish. <clears throat> Amen. And nothing can stop him. He's faithful to his vision. He's faithful to his word. He's yes. faithful to whatever he sets into motion. It has to come to pass. Yes. Amen. So we need to manifest those characteristics in our life. He said, uh, you know, you were created in my image and after my likeness. And, I, and I'm thinking, yeah, but I mean, you're God. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. He said, no, I'm a spirit. Mm -hmm. And so are you. Mm -hmm. So... He's saying you should manifest by your spirit these same attributes that I have, which are faith, persistence, faithfulness to the word, whatever he says, it's going to come to pass. He's telling us to be the same thing, to do the same things. And that's how we get the results. We are his offspring. We have his DNA. Yeah. We are children of God. Yeah. Another word that helps us understand God is, is uh, steadfast, mm -hmm. which means to stand fast or stand steady in the face of resistance because typically as humans we want to reset to the fetal position <laughs> Praise the Lord. just back off so that the pressure will go away so it, it, you know you know what I'm saying just yeah. don't but he's saying stand fast be steadfast in the face of 
the, re the resistance or the pressure that comes against you. Amen? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. I was thinking, uh, he said, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand... Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, the word of God, and having on the blessed breastplate of righteousness, which is your identity. Amen? Yes. So when opposition comes, you don't go back where you were. The fact is, opposition ought to strengthen us. It ought to make us stronger. Yes. I remember in the Marine Corps, when you went through boot camp and, and training, that you had to learn all the Marine Corps history. And uh, Dan can relate to this. You, they would ask you. You'd be on guard duty or something, and they come up, "What's the, you know, second general command or general law?" Or then they'd ask you, "Okay, what's the uh, what's the orders of the day?" And then they'd say, "What happened in 16 blah blah blah?" Or what happened, uh, you know, the in in this part of the world or at this particular time? And you were supposed to know this stuff. You had the little red book. It wasn't Mao's book. It was the, <laughs> the Marine Corps Bible, basically. Praise the Lord. And I remember one was in Korea when they were completely surrounded, they were cut off from everybody else and they were surrounded and they asked this general who was in charge of the troops at, there at that time what they were going to do and he radioed back that uh, we got them just where we want them. We can shoot in any direction and we can't miss. There wasn't any question about resetting or backing up or running away or finding a way out of this thing. It was like we're here for this reason, that's why we're here, so that's what we're going to do. And that's kind of the way it is with us. It looks like sometimes we're completely surrounded and the enemy's trying to get us to figure out some way of sneaking out of this thing, yeah. when in fact, what God is saying is, if you can see that it's the enemy, you have the victory over him. Yeah. All you have to do is use the weapons yes. that you have available. Amen? Yes. The weapons of your warfare are not carnal, no. but they're mighty through yes. God to the pulling down of strongholds or destroying, yes. amen, of the enemy. So. Courage is just another word in regard to uh, persistence. It's the ability to stand up in the face of fear. Now, let me explain. First of all, fear is not the opposite of faith. I've heard that taught, but I don't believe it. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. Amen? It's impossible. In fact, it's, it, you can't have courage without fear. I've been afraid in my life plenty of times. Amen? And not just in the military, but I put myself in situations that I shouldn't have been in that turned out to be kind of frightening. Amen. But that's how you know if you have courage right. is when you're afraid and you do it anyway. Yeah. Right? That's, that's what courage is. It's, it's not succumbing to the fear. It's not giving in to the fear, but using as the fear as an impetus or a uh, a means by which you can get to the place of courage by saying, I'm not giving into this. I'm not buckling down to that thing or that person or that situation or whatever it is. I'm going to move forward. Yes. Amen. That's called courage. Amen. If we don't have any fear, we're not living in faith. Yeah. Praise the Lord. If there's no opposition, you don't need faith. Right? right? If there's no resistance, right. you're not moving anyhow. Right. Praise the Lord. So that sounds strange, I know, but faith always demands that we do something that we know we're not capable of doing on our own. Right. That's what makes it faith. Mm -hmm. If I can do it, I don't need faith. I just right. need to do it. Right. My job is to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Yes. To not be moved by the circumstance or the situation, but to trust that God's got the answer for it. And he will provide yes. the means yeah. to overcome the, the circumstance or the situation, right? Look at Joshua chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 6 through 9. Joshua 1, 6 through 9. <laughs> Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and be courageous, 
that thou mayest observe to do according to the law, all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou may, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So why did God say that? Duh. Because Joshua was scared. Amen? But see, fear is a positive thing when it gives birth to courage. Yes. It was the fear that God came to overcome. Yes. Be of good courage. Yes. I'm with you. I'm going to give you the victory. Amen? Matthew 19, verse 26. See, Jesus loves us to get into those positions where it looks frightening yep. so that we'll use courage because it's through that courage he said to them with men it's impossible but with God yes. all things are possible right. praise the Lord so he likes to see us in the possible situ impossible situation because impossible is always possible with yes. God yes. it's always the reality of God even though it looks like the opposite to us mm -hmm. praise the Lord Genesis 32 verse 26 He said, let me go, for the day breaketh. This is the angel of the Lord. Actually, it's a manifestation of God that Jacob is wrestling with, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Right. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So look, persistence says to life what Jacob said to the Lord. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving in until I get the blessing, until I get... Right. what you promised. Right. Amen? It's like the woman that knocks at the door. She's persistent. This isn't about how many times you've got to ask God. This is about saying what God has yes. said. Amen? And not quitting until you get what it is you came for. Right. She was after bread, and she just would not stop knocking until the guy finally said, here, take the bread and let me get some sleep. Yeah. Amen? Well, this is how we have to work. It is, I'm not trying to manipulate God to get Him to do something. He's already told me what He's going to do. I have to deal with life. Yeah. So every day I've got to go beating on the door of life and saying, Hey, this is mine. This belongs to me. You promised me. Amen? Yes. So you have, you, you've got a promise from God for your life, right? Yep. If life refuses on Monday, then you go back Tuesday. Yes. And you say, This belongs to me. Yes. Amen. If life says no on Tuesday, you go back on Wednesday and say, this belongs to me. Yes. Amen. Yes. If Wednesday says no, you go back on Thursday. This belongs to me. I'm not letting go of it. I'm not giving up on it. Amen. And then you go back on Friday and Friday says, no, you can't have it. Then you just say the same thing. This belongs to me. And eventually life will give it up. Yes. The natural will have to submit to the spirit. Yes. But somebody has to put pressure on it yes. for it to come to pass. And that's yes. you. And you can't be, you can't know that because for so and so they got it immediately and you didn't. Right. That's not the issue. The issue is will I keep knocking until I get it? Or will I keep saying, like Jacob, I'm not letting you go till I get the promise, till I get the fulfillment of this thing? I'm not quitting. I'm not going to stop until I get what it is I have a promise for. The world, the earth, is not going to stop my receiving all that God has given me. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Yes, that's right. Amen? 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Because I promise you, if you keep after it, yep. life will eventually say, take it. Yep. Just take it and let me be. Yep. Amen. Ye are God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Yes. Amen. I mean, we know God wants us to be fighters. Yes. Amen. He wants us to, to not be cowards and, and wimps. He wants us to fight. The Bible calls us soldiers. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 2, 
verses 3 and 4. Fight the good fight of faith, right? The weapons of your warfare are not... We, we, we got warfare. The weapons are just different. That's all. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this, this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So you don't let life dictate to you. You let your commanding officer dictate yes. to you. Or God. Yes. He tells you what is and what isn't. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. So... Uh, we don't receive medals from God. We're soldiers, we're in the army, we're, we're in a battle, and so on and so forth. But what we receive is promises. Amen? Revelation 12, 11. And we overcome. We are more than overcomers because of Him. And He says that we overcome by the word of our testimony. Yes. Praise the Lord. And the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb gave us the right to use the testimony. Yep. His, his yes. dying on the cross yes. gave us the right to use this word yes. for whatever purposes we have need of. Yes. Amen? Yes. Otherwise, we have an access to it. We have access to it simply because He died to give us that. Yes. He put us in the position where we are now soldiers of the Lord and we can use those promises, yes. amen, for whatever needs we have. Amen? They love not their lives unto the death. Praise the Lord. So we can have bumps, we got bruises, we got pains, we've got heartaches, uh, disappointments, amen. But you keep moving towards the promise by trusting God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Don said it. Anybody that thinks Christianity is just a free ride, they don't know Christianity. Amen. There's battles to be fought. He has given us the victory, but we still got to stand in the place of battle. It's no different than, than Joshua. He said, I'm going to go before you, but here's some stuff you're going to have to do. It looks crazy. It doesn't make sense. Don't know how you're going to be able to overcome the enemy. Gideon's another perfect example. Every time he thought, well, you know, 10,000 people, I suppose maybe we'll have a chance of whipping the enemy. And God said, no, that's too many. Try, try 500. 500? Yeah. I was just kidding. 300. To where it has to be God, where it, you, you yes. can't take the credit for it. You, you realize that, okay, there's going to be another battle someday. Yep. And I may not have access to 10,000 men then. Yep. i got to believe that God can give me the victory yep. when it's just me and a handful of people. Yep. Praise the Lord. Thank God. So, we got to trust the Lord. Romans 8, verses 35 through 37. And... And I know, we'd like to be able to, which is one reason why, you know, in Pentecostal circles and charismatics, we, we love to run to some meeting and let somebody just wave their hand over us. Yeah. Because that way I don't have to, you know, really get into the battle. They've already got the battle won for me. I just get to share in the spoils. Right. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are times when there are anointings and, and healings and so forth take place in meetings like that. But the truth is what God wants is for you to fight your own battles yes. using the Word of God. Yes. Because you're not going to have access to some big meeting somewhere or some right. uh, well-known minister or whatever. Sometimes you're going to wake up in the middle of the night and you're yeah. going to realize, I need some answers and I need them now before yeah. daylight. Before right. I'm going to get anything accomplished or if this person's going to live or this finance is going to come through or whatever. I need to do something now. I can't wait to get to a meeting next month in California or someplace. Praise right. the Lord. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Praise the Lord. So God has put so much in you that if you're willing to capture it, if you're willing to fight for it, amen, nothing can stop you. Amen. Mark 4.21. Candle, again, he's talking about this word, having this revelation. Nay, and all these other, and he said unto him, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? The people that endure to the end succeed. The ones who don't give up, the ones who don't give in. See, there's not enough darkness in the world to extinguish the light that God has put in you. If you will let the light shine, if you don't, sub you know, if you don't hide it, if you don't uh, submerse it into the situation or the circumstance, but if you raise it up, if you take the word and put it above, 
Amen. It will accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish. Praise God. Amen. Isaiah 54, verse 13. Let me, let me just read. I'm going to read. A lot of people have a lot of life scriptures. I've actually got two. Now, I read, a lot, I read the scriptures and I confess them and so on and so forth. There's two that have resonated with me from the very beginning. And then God has brought them back to me over time. And they're the ones that I always rely on in the end. No matter what's going on, no matter what the situation is. First one is, uh, well, this is the second one actually. But all thy children will be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. Mm -hmm. Anybody got children, you know you need that every once in a while because yeah. it doesn't look like it. Right. Praise the Lord. And I, my, I know my parents needed it for sure, probably more, th more so than most. But that's a scripture that I quote all the time. It's a scripture that I speak back to God yes. constantly. Yes. Every time I hear a negative, I'm saying, all of my children are taught of the Lord, yes. and great shall be the peace of my children. They're not going to be freaking out and wringing their hands and, yes. and going nuts in the world. They're going to have the peace of God. Yes. They're going to be taught of the Lord. And that means they're led by the Holy Spirit, not just stuff that I say to them or, or try to preach to them but what the Holy Spirit will yes. deal with them individually. Because I'm not going to be there all the time anyway. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And the other one is uh, Genesis 15.1. This one God gave to me when I was wringing my hands over all kinds of stuff. It had to do with the church, it was finances, it was regular life and everything else. And this is what the Lord said to me. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. Yes. An exceeding great reward. Yes, glory. Only he just put my name in there. Yeah. And every time the crap hits and every time the stuff starts going sideways and looking crazy, that's yes. where God brings me back to. Yes. Fear not. Oh, Amen. I am thy shield. I'm your protection and I'm your reward. Yes. Not only do I protect you from the enemy, but I bless you in his presence. Yes. Amen. He's, I'm seated, amen, at the table with my enemies and my cup overflows. Yes. Amen? Thank you, God. Praise God. When God showed Abraham the land that his descendants were going to inherit, this is something, because I, I, after I got this, I thought, okay, that's the Lord. I knew it was the Lord. You know how it is. Sometimes you'll get a scripture and you go, just, you know that that's God talking to you. He's trying to get you to understand something you can rest on, you can depend on. So I start reading a little bit more and studying a little bit more about Abraham. But here's the deal. When Abraham was shown the land by God that he was going to receive, him and his descendants, they were going to inherit. He told him that everything, he said, as far as you can see, it's going to be yours. In other words, for me, that's as far as I can believe, I can have. As much as I can believe for, it's mine. It belongs to me, right? And so this is what he's telling him. But the problem was the land was full of Moabites, and Hittites, and Canaanites, and Amorites, all that would be Israel's enemies. Praise the Lord. So let's look at Mark 4, 13 through 20 again. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then shall you know all parables of sower so at the word? And these are they by the wayside. Abraham had a word from God. The word was, everything you can believe me for is yours. As far as you want to go with it, I'll, I'll be there for you. As long as you believe me. As long as you trust me. Yeah. But there were Amorites. There were Hittites. There were Canaanites. There were Hivites. There were all of these ites. Enemies. And when they heard, when they heard those, Satan comes immediately. Yeah. So God gives us a promise. And immediately the Hittites show up. This is yours. It belongs to you. Then why the enemy with the swords and the spears? What are they doing out there on my property? Yeah. But this is what he's saying. And taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. The fear, right? Why they wouldn't go into the promised land in the first place. Yeah. So these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground. Who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness. Now when God told them I'm giving you the promised land. They were, there wasn't anybody negative about that. They thought it was great until they got over there and found out there was resistance. Mm -hmm. Then they said... <laughs> we'll just stay here. The resistance is a pain. Mm -hmm. We found out if we don't move, mm -hmm. we don't suffer resistance. Right. But we don't get the promise either. Right. So these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, 
have no root in themselves and so endure for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. This is Israel in the promised land. And now the enemy comes against them and they begin to connect with the enemy instead of with God. They start giving in to the enemy or trying to go around them instead of going through them the way God told them. And the enemy gets the upper hand and they don't drive them out of their land. They are still there to haunt them and to, to torment them every time they try to possess the thing that God has promised them. Amen. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, cares of the world, and deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things enter in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. I think it's self-explanatory. This is stuff that we go through, right? And these are they which are sown in good ground, such as hear the word, receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. Praise the Lord. So when God gives us promises, they attract the enemy. Praise the Lord. You know, the enemy's attracted to this place. Yeah. You say, well, what the hell are we doing here then? Because if we're not here, he overruns the place. Yeah. We are the thing that holds him back. Yes. Not just from this building, but from the area of influence that we may have. Yes. May not be across the street. It may be, it may be in your hometown. It may be in, in your neighborhood. It may be, but that's what this is about. Yes. Praise the Lord. So the promise attracts the enemy that we don't see at first. We just see the promise. Praise the Lord. This would be cool to have that, you know. Instead, the promise looks great, but the enemies are still there. Hebrews 6 and 12. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Thank God he didn't stop there. Yes. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Yes. So there's crap going to happen. But don't give in because I've overcome the crap. Yes. If you'll stay faithful, if you'll trust me, if you'll believe me, yes. it may not look the way it's supposed to look. It may not be unfolding the way you think it's supposed to unfold. But I promise you the end yes. will be better than the beginning. He'll yes. give you more. Amen. If you, if you lose anything, you're going to get way more as a result of that. You may not lose anything. That's right. Remember, no weapon formed against you can prosper. But every tongue, every lie of the devil, every enemy that we have, and we don't battle against flesh and blood. It's flesh and blood that we have to deal with, but it's the enemy, the spirit behind that flesh and blood that's manipulating that person to act the way they act and do the things that they do. Amen. And if we don't give in to that, no weapon formed against you can prosper. That's right. And every tongue that accuses you, every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you condemn. Not God. God doesn't do it. You condemn it. You tell him, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am blessed of the Lord. No weapon formed against me can prosper. But you've got to do it. You've got to say it. It's he has put his hand to our lips. And he said, I need somebody to go. Who, who will go for me? It ought to be us saying, yes. I'll go, send me. Yep. And he said, then go and tell them. The crap they're hearing isn't the truth. Yes. That's right. That's right. What they've been hearing with their ears is not the truth. That's what they've right. been seeing with their eyes is not the truth. They need to hear the truth. Yes. And they need to hear it from somebody that knows the yes. truth. And that's why I'm sending you. Because you said, I'll say what you said. Yes. Praise the Lord. God. Be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience... Inherit the promises. You don't inherit the promises by sitting somewhere and complaining about how bad the situation is. Mm. Even if it's true. Especially if it's true. Right. You inherit the promise through faith and patience. Praise God. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Your confidence or your faith produces recompense, yep. payback, yep. and reward. Amen? Yes. Because you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. It's just kind of another way of saying, after you've done all to do, stand. Right. When you've stood all you can stand, stand some more. 
Because God is going to give you the promise and that's the only way you can receive it. Praise the Lord. Yep. See, we say who we really are. Well, who we really are is blessed. Yes. And to experience anything other than that is, is experiencing God. something that doesn't belong to you. Yes. It's not your identity. It doesn't right. belong. That crap that's coming, it right. doesn't belong to you. Right. It's not yours. Right. You're blessed. Yes. Amen. That has to be your confession. Yes. Ephesians 1 uh, verses 4 and 5. Now, I want to show you something here. Hopefully I'm not going to get too weird. But according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Now He's not saying we have to do something to make that happen. That's what He's already done. Before the foundation of the world. If you weren't here last week, I, that's what I was talking about. The end from the beginning. And we already are what we are. The fact that we're here right now proves that. Because we were in Him before the foundation of the world. Now we've been born again. Once we've been born again, what were we born again to? What we were before the foundation of the world when we were in Christ. Yep. What is in, the, in Christ before the foundation of the world? Everything you have need of. Yes. Yes. Everything that we have... God isn't being surprised by the enemy coming and trying to rip you off from this and, and right. kill you or, or whatever it might be. God knows that. He knew it before the foundation of the world. And he put in you what you need to overcome whatever it is the enemy is going to try to throw at you. So, and it doesn't come as a shock to God. It comes as a surprise to us, but not to God. So that's why we need to trust in him and what he has said about the situation instead of us trying to figure it out right. when we're panicked and freaking. Right? right? So without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Now, the Calvinist would say, okay, there, there's proof for predestination. No, we were predestined in him. In other words, if we get born again, we get what we were in him. We get what we were predestined to be. Not everybody reaches their destiny because they don't trust God. They don't get born again. It's not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But we know that everybody's going to be saved. Not everybody's going to repent and get born again and get the benefits. Right. Amen. But he has predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So in the foundation, where we were in the foundation of the world before anything existed, God had a family. Yeah. And he said, if you will come to me, if you will trust me, you get all of this back. And this, it, it's basically the same thing that Jesus is talking about when he says, you in me, I in him, we're all in God. Yeah. All he's basically saying is this takes us back to what we were in the original creation. Mm -hmm. In God. All the access, all the benefits, all that God is, we have it. Yeah. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Amen. All right. Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast. What well, the devil do? He, he tricked them into losing their, their initial or their original identity what they were in God before he, they were created as human beings. Amen? So that affects everybody from then on. And so he says, this is God speaking, and what he's going to do as a result of what the enemy did. You're cursed above all cattle, above all every beast of the field, upon the belly thou shalt go, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, or her offspring. Mm -hmm. Everyone that comes after, and between thy seed and her seed, it will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. Now, we know that's talking about Jesus, right? He's going to bruise Jesus' heel. He's going to the cross, but Jesus is going to crush the enemy, mm -hmm. totally destroy him. So Jesus came. He was sent, let me put it this way. Jesus was sent to be our Savior about 4,000 years ago. Or I should say, about 4,000 years after the fall. Mm -hmm. Right? He was sent 4,000 years after that statement was made. Jesus shows up on the scene mm -hmm. to redeem humanity back to that original condition. Mm -hmm. 
Humanly speaking, I got to tell you, that's a hell of a long time to be waiting, to be praying, to be believing, to be trusting, to hoping, expecting. Amen? Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4 again. I'm just showing you how God works in the extreme. And he said, the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain upon tables that it may run, that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. God didn't say that, but that's what he was talking about in Genesis. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Mm -hmm. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. Now with that in mind, look at the context here. When the fullness of the time was come, 4,000 years according to what we just read, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, that we might be put back into that original condition, right? So Jesus came in the fullness of time, and based on that alone, I can promise you, so will your promise. Mm -hmm. In the fullness of time, your promise has to come to pass. It may not look like it's coming when it ought to. It may not be happening as quickly as you want to. But I'm telling you, God cannot lie. And if, and if it, it took 4,000, the reason it took 4,000 years, God wants us to see He is faithful to His Word no matter how long it takes. It has to come to pass. When people started crying out for their Messiah, the fullness of time had come. Somebody there was going to believe. As few as it was going to be, they would still believe. Amen. It won't tarry if you have faith. Amen? He said, it'll tarry. Wait for it. Because it won't tarry. Contradiction, but he's saying, it'll seem like it's tearing. It'll seem like it's taking a long time. But if you will stand, it has to come to pass. It won't tarry. It will show up. Amen. And show out on your behalf. Praise the Lord. Amen. Proverbs 16, verses 32 and 33. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Man, I, that should be a life scripture. He that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. Now that is important. Because if you can't control your spirit, you're not going to have any faith. Amen? He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. You know what happens when people don't get the thing that they believe they should have, when they should have it. They get angry. Yeah, they, do. they get mad at God. They get mad at the church. They get mad at some preacher. They get mad at somebody that's testified or witnessed yeah. to them or whatever it might be, right? And he said somebody that is slow to anger, in other words, tap the brakes here a minute. Yeah. Something's happening here that's more than just you not getting your thing in 24 hours. Right. It's about developing your spirit yes. to believe no matter what the situation or circumstance is. Because I'm telling you, before this thing is all over, you're going to be faced with stuff that's way bigger than what you've gone through already. And you better have some control, amen, and believe what your spirit has told you by the Word of God. Because the Spirit will only speak to you what the Word says. The spirit doesn't talk to you about negative crap. Right? The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is the Lord. Right? So crap happens to everybody. It's just, you wake up and there it is. It's in your lap. Dumped in your lap, right? Mm -hmm. But he said the disposing thereof is the Lord. So crap's going to happen, but don't focus on the crap. God is going to take care of it, whether it's the word or whether it's the junk, amen, that you find in your lap. Praise the Lord. The disposing thereof is the Lord. How does the Lord dispose of it? By his word. 
by us saying what he says about the circumstance and not just focusing on the crap that's in our lap. Right. Sorry I'm being vulgar this morning. I'm just frustrated with life in general. Amen. So I'm getting a little bit too real maybe. I don't intend to be crude. I'm just saying sometimes you just got to say it like it is. You know, I mean, it's just there's no point in trying to whitewash stuff. There's crap happening in our lives. We know that there is. There's junk that the enemy's trying to force feed us with. And we need to understand that the way out of this mess is the Lord. Amen. The way out of it is by the Word of God. No matter what is dumped on us at any given time, He is the means by which we're going to get, escape and be blessed. Amen. So, hallelujah. John 15, 5. He is the vine. We are the branches. In other words, He's the tree. Everything flows through Him, and then we get to produce the fruit. Yeah. Actually, we just become the vehicle through which He produces fruit. Right. So, as long as we stay connected, how do we stay connected? By the Word of God. He's going to produce, through this Word, fruit that will appear on us. Right. It will look like to a, to a commoner, to an unbeliever, as though we did something to make it happen. We'll know, and God knows, all I did was abide. Right? The dude abides. Praise the Lord. I just took... Okay, this is another movie. Uh, but I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Jesus said the same thing about the Lord. It's not me that does the works. It's the Father that's in me. Right? I can do nothing of myself. Now remember, he is Alpha Omega. Beginning and end. God is not only the author of your promise, he's also the support system as you progress to the manifestation. Praise the Lord. He's everything. He's all that we have need of. Amen. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Right. Matthew 28, 20. See, you can't, first of all, we know you can't separate God from His Word. So teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So God has invested Himself in your promise. Amen? And so he has to bring it to pass. It's as, it's as though it's him himself. All right? Ecclesiastes 3.10. I have seen the travail. That word travail literally translates burden. Uh, that's the, the literal uh, Greek translation which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Amen? And so the word here, which is literally translated burden, in Hebrew is translated then as a heavy responsibility. So he's saying, I've seen the heavy responsibility which God has given to the sons of men to exercise it. That's the piece of eternity that he put in you. That heavy responsibility, that travail, that burden, amen, that's the piece of eternity that he puts in you. And that is so through you, he can reveal his faithfulness, his goodness, and his grace. The burden is, is that we don't give up and make God a liar. Not that we can make him a liar, but you know what I'm saying. We can make it look as though God didn't say the truth. God didn't tell the truth. That's the burden that we carry. It isn't this other, you know, all the intercession and stuff, and I'm not against that, but I'm just saying that's really not the focus. The focus there is the burden. The burden is that I don't back off of what God has said, amen, and make it look like to others that God doesn't tell the truth or that God changes his mind or that what God said for one person he won't do for another. Right. Ephesians 3, verse 20. And I'll, this same idea is carried on here. And he, he tells us in Ephesians 3.20 that it's what's working in us, right? Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, 
unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Now, I, I know that we've heard it multiple times and think that we know it. I'm speaking for me anyway. And for me, I'm not so sure I've really understood what it's saying. According to his power, or one translation is according to his potential, what he's capable of. Amen? That potential is at work where? Not in heaven, not off in some weird, you know, monastery somewhere. It's in us. The potential power is in us. God put his word and his spirit in us. That spirit is a piece of eternity. God is eternal. He's a spirit. He gives us his eternal spirit. That is a chunk or a piece of eternity. This word is the eternal word of God. Before there was anything, there was God. And with God was the word and the word was God. And he puts that into us when we believe. We go back to that foundation, amen, before the foundation of the world. We were in Christ, amen. Let me just say it this way. That's more than enough potential for anybody, for anything. The potential is unlimited. It's God. The implications of this, it, it means that what you're able to accomplish, what you personally are able to accomplish, has nothing to do with your talent or your ability. It has to do with who's in you. Right. It has specifically to do with the power that is working in you, the potential that is in you. I, I, I prefer to call it power, but the truth is it's more accurate to call it potential because everybody's not taking advantage of the power. And the reason is because they don't understand the potential. Right. There's no limit to the potential, just as there's no limit to the power if somebody can believe. If thou canst believe, yep. all things are possible. Yep. In other words, there's no limit to the potential that's in you or the power that's available to you. That is the power of God's Word and the Spirit that lives in us to fulfill every promise. That's why it's in us, to bring to pass what He has said. Yep. Amen? The finished work. God's power is working in you for a reason. The reason for that Word to work in you is to fulfill the Word, yep. to make it come to pass. He'll do immeasurably or exceedingly abundantly beyond all I can ask or think or even imagine. Yep. In other words, my imagine, and I, I can come up with some pretty crazy imaginations, but my imagination, amen, isn't big enough for what God really wants to do. That's why I have to have the word. Because when I read this, it, a lot of times it's like, oh yeah, well, pretty hard to get my head around that. In other words, my imagination is having trouble seeing that as being a reality for me. And God is saying, yes, but if you'll say what the Word says, even though this is more than you can imagine, it will still come to pass in your life. You'll if you keep coming, if you keep coming back to life, if you keep coming back to life, you keep coming, it's mine, it's mine, the Word says it's mine, God has declared it's mine, it was mine before the foundation of the world, eventually the world will go, all right, take it. Praise the Lord. Yes. We can't imagine everything God wants for us. Mm -hmm. And yet God gave us the gift of imagination yes. to keep us from focusing only on the present situation. See, that's the difference between us and animals. Yep. Animals have no imagination. They have no self-awareness. Mm -hmm. God gave man this, this ability that makes him like God, the ability to imagine. Mm -hmm. What did God do? He imagined light because there wasn't any. Yeah. And then he just spoke it. And because of his faith being perfect, light was. Yeah. Everything he's ever done, he's done by his imagination first, or thoughts, and then speaking it into words. I said it last week. Thoughts are the most important things in the world. But words are the most powerful. Yeah. Thoughts design the word, yeah. or the setting for the word. Yeah. It's like a blueprint. It's like a, a diagram. You've got to have the plan before it can be put into work. Amen? So the plan 
It's important. But what's powerful is what we say about it, is what we declare it to be. Amen? So God gives us this gift of imagination because he wants us to take a tour of his word or his promises. You know, see, it takes imagination, even though you have the word of God. Am I just nuts? Or, or when I read this, and I, it takes a little imagination for me to believe, to see this thing is going to come to pass in my life. It takes some imagination. And so God gave me that imagination, amen, so that I could take a tour, so I could go down through this word and, and see the possibilities of what God had said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. I gotta imagine. I gotta think outside of my own natural way of thinking. I have to imagine something that doesn't make sense in the natural. That's God's way of leading me down the path to His Word, to His promise, to His, to His truth. Amen? Why? So that then He can bring me back to the present and say, what do you think? And I say, let's go there, God. Yeah. Amen? See, what, is he, what did He do? He took me back to before the foundation of the world. Yeah. And He showed me everything, and He shows us everything that actually is ours, that we have access to. It's in our imagination. He shows it all to us so that when we get back to reality, when we come back to the natural realm that we're in, I can say, or we can say to God, let's go there. Let's, let's go and get that. Let's go back to that reality. We are new creatures in Christ. That's why. That's what all of this is about. That's what the new birth is about. Access back to our true identity. Back to what we are in God. Not as humans, but in God. One with Him. Part of Him. Eternal. Yes, yes. Amen. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Now, this is, this is interesting because it's a type of all of us as well. And God says to Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. How did he know him? Before the foundation of the world. He was in him. He was a part of God, right? I mean, we have, I, I pray, and every morning when I pray for salvation, I've got an old buddy of mine that I hooked up with, kind of weird through the f emails and stuff that I hadn't seen for 50 years. And when, I was, when we were running together in the Marine Corps and after we f f first got out, God was the last thing on our mind, I promise you. And I got to thinking about this because we communicated back and forth a few times, and I thought, Lord, this isn't making any sense. I'm probably not going to see the guy. I mean, we were good buddies and everything, but that was so long ago, and so many things have passed. And the Lord spoke to me one night. In the middle of the night, I woke up thinking about this guy. And the Lord said, why do you suppose I brought him to your, you know, in, back into your life? I don't know. I don't know. thought maybe we would just get together and laugh about old times or something, you know. And the Lord said, No. You were the means to him before the foundation of the world. You thought it was about your five years in the Marine Corps and overseas and running around afterwards and partying and carrying on and everything else. It had nothing to do with that. It was a connection I had to have to get to him so that somebody would be praying for his salvation. Yeah. So every morning now when I pray for my kids and grandkids and great-grandchildren and all that will come after me, I remind the Lord of my old buddy Dave. Yeah. I said... You put him back in my life, and I'm praying for his salvation, that he'll be saved and know you as his Lord and Savior yeah. before he leaves this planet so that we can be back in the foundation of the world where we started out in you. So he has the same access back to you yes. that I've been given. Yes. Amen? And so he said, sanctify, I ordained thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, I ordained thee, I, I was a prophet unto the nations. Now, I don't know when that happened. It could have happened a thousand years earlier. It could have happened before the foundation of the world, but whatever, God had already determined this was going to be the reality for this guy. Yeah. Amen? So he used this past tense. He had already set apart and appointed Jeremiah as a prophet. And yet, the first thing Jeremiah responds to is, hey, I don't know how to speak. Didn't Paul say we should all prophesy? Well, this is what he's talking about. Prophecy is speaking the word of God in faith, believing that that's the truth. And what do we say? The same thing Jeremiah does. You know, I'm not very good at this, speaking stuff. Yeah. I'm not really good at saying what you've said or understanding what you said and then saying it the same way. Amen? God's reaction was, in effect, 
shut up. Don't say that. Amen? I built you to be a prophet. Don't tell me you can't talk. We say, I can't, it doesn't work for me. He said, don't talk that way. I created you for this purpose. That's why you're different than the animals. The animals can't confess the word. The, the beasts, they can't do this. Only you can do this. Right. I've created you for this very purpose. Right. Praise the Lord. Second right. Peter uh, 1, verses 2 through 4. Going a little late here. I'm trying to hurry. Praise the Lord. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Why are they given to us? So that we can have all that stuff that He gave us. Yes. So that we can access it. Amen. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Yes. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Mm -hmm. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation or restoring these things back. So once God had showed Jeremiah why he was born, Jeremiah discovered what he could do. Praise the Lord. You are a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. He's telling you who you are, amen, so that you can discover what you can do, what you're capable of. In other words, when Jeremiah discovered or, or when he understood his identity, he began to realize his ability. Mm -hmm. Hey, if I've got this unbelievable power in me or potential in me because of who I am in Christ, maybe I ought to start trying to make it work. Maybe I ought to see if I can't develop it, if I can't cause it to come to pass. Amen. As I can't see the ability, amen, come about. See, at first he didn't think he could do it. He didn't think he could speak for God. He didn't think he could say what God said. But whatever God calls for, God provides for. Mm -hmm. Whatever is required, he enables us to do. And he enables us to do it by his word and by faith. So the crap that we're in shouldn't come as a surprise. It's God's way of overcoming that crap by giving us the potential or the ability, amen, to deal with it. Jeremiah 1 verse 9 Then the Lord put his forth his hand and touched my mouth. This is kind of like what you saw with Isaiah. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Yeah. So you've got to understand that whatever, whatever you need from God, whatever you have to have, has already been placed in you. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God. It's already there. You already have access to it. Yes. God put it there. Amen. The Word and the Spirit were given to draw out. Amen. What's already inside of us. Yes. Yes. Amen. That activates God's power. Yes. See, potential, praise the Lord, potential is realized when we say yes to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, to understand that, you have to understand John 15, 5, which is, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and Mark 4, where it's talking about the Word so the word, so the word, so the word. So I'm going to, I'll just, let me wrap it up with this. And it's a, a, a truth that's derived from an analogy uh, from nature. In creation, God gave trees the ability to reproduce themselves through their seed, right? Now, everything's for a purpose. I mean, it isn't just so that trees will do it, but he's giving us the example or the prototype of how everything will work in this realm. Amen? And so the, it starts out with trees. Every tree, every fruit bearing tree, he says, the life of that is in the seed. Right? So he gave trees the ability to reproduce themselves through their seed. And by doing that, he was commanding trees to come out of seeds. Amen? 
First, he put the potential for the trees in the seeds. Amen. Then he told human, humanity, in essence, if you plant the seeds and you put them in the right environment, they're going to eventually become what I put in them. Their potential. What is their potential? Fully grown trees. Our lives are like seed. We were born again with the potential for the fulfillment of 2 Peter 1 and Ephesians 1, which is all things are ours. It belongs to us. It was in us. Amen. Our destinies have already been established within us. That's what I was talking about some last week. Why? Because the seed is in us. The seed produces, we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. We got born again. We have the seed in us. The Word of God is in us. And it will, it has to produce after its own kind. In other words, the maturity of this thing is that Christ will be formed in you. In other words, all that you have need of is available to you. But you have to work the system. You have to do it the way God intended it to be done or it won't work. I don't care how brilliant the idea or the plan might be, if it isn't based on the Word of God and the seed of God producing what you already are, all you're doing is flailing around out here trying to make up something or cause something to happen that you have absolutely no control over. Yeah. Amen. We are simply calling forth what God has already put in us. Right. Plant the seed and do that by speaking it. Yep. And then you nurture it by the word and by faith. Yes. It'll develop until it's fully grown and the scripture says it'll bear much fruit. Yes. The vision, the scripture said, is for an appointed time. Yep. At the end, it will speak and not lie. Right. Let me just say this. You are the end or you are the fulfillment amen of that seed in the earth, of Christ's seed in the earth. He said, though it tarry, it won't tarry, it will come to pass. Yes. It will not tarry, it will be revealed full grown and mature. Yes. Praise the Lord. If you don't give up, you get what He promised. Amen? Yes. God is not a liar. This stuff has to happen, but somebody has got to have... The stay to it enough, the stick to it enough, the, the persistence, the faithfulness, the confidence in order for it to come to pass. Because it doesn't just happen because somebody waves a wand. It happens because we are persistent. We keep coming back. We keep knocking. We keep saying, it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. And eventually that seed will produce full grown realities. Whether it's healing, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's relational, whatever it is. It has to come to pass. Trouble is, we get frustrated with life. We get frustrated with people. We get frustrated with situations, and we just throw up our hands and say, the hell with it. Just give me a shot and a beer back, and we'll deal with it tomorrow. Amen. And God is saying, this is not the time to be giving up or to giving in. This is the end time. You have been placed here at this time for a purpose. And the purpose is for the world to see that this thing is true, that this is real, and it can't be separated from God. And God will do whatever He has promised He'd do in this Word if He can find somebody that will say, Here am I, send me. Yes. Yes. I'll say it. I'll do it. Amen? Amen? So with all the frustrations, with all the things we've talked about this morning, and whether it's you know one thing or another, the truth is, if I say what God said, God has got to do what God promised. Yes. No matter how long it takes, no matter how negative the situation might seem at the time, no matter how many people say no, yep. somebody's got to say yes and keep on saying yes, yes. until we see the results. Right. That's what I think this church is about. I think that's what God has put us here. We've all come from all kinds of weird different yep. backgrounds and churches and all this stuff, different religious kind of teachings and all of that thing. Yep. But it's so that God can come together in a body and show himself mighty so that he can produce what only God can produce. And I promise you, when the, 
when those promises start unfolding and we start seeing whether it's the dead being raised, whether it's financial breakthrough in people's lives, whatever it might be, amen, people from the outside are going to go and say, what the heck's going on with you guys? I mean, how'd that happen for you? And then this thing and that thing. I'll tell you why. Because there's a little group of people over here that don't know a whole lot about everything, but they know a little bit about something that's very important. And that is that God will not lie. If you can believe Him and stay with Him, He'll produce whatever you're believing for. As long as it's in this Word, it has to come to pass. I'm telling you, win more people to Jesus that way than all the rules, all the regulations, all the promises, all the, all the begging and pleading and everything else and fear tactics and all the rest of that crap when they see that God is really good and all God wants to do is to bless them with everything that life has that they have need of in this life and in the eternal then they're going to say this is a pretty good God I think I'll give this a try yes amen and that's all he's asking for they waited 4,000 years for the promise amen but they kept believing Somebody started crying out and saying, I'm not letting go until I get the blessing. Amen. Jesus shows up 2,000 years later. And now here we are, or 4,000 years later, I should say. Now here we are 2,000 years later. And we could say the same thing about the promises. But I'll tell you what happens when somebody believes. When somebody starts crying out for that promise to be fulfilled based on what God's word says. That time will come. The fullness of time will come and the promise will be revealed. The promise will be given. We'll experience it. And that's where we're at. That's what I believe where we are at this moment in time. Those promises, just as real and as valid as Jesus was that they waited 4,000 years for, we've been waiting 2,000 years for the same thing that was made available to us back then. We can know what Jesus said. It's all mine. It's all yours. If it's all mine, it all belongs to you. But it took 2,000 years for people to get to the place where they're saying, you know what, I'm not taking second best. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm not going to take this crap for what God has promised. I'm going to stand until I get the promise from God. I'm not letting go, Lord, until you bless me. And that's all he's waiting for. That's not twisting God's arm. That's saying, Lord, I believe you. I believe you enough that I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep on believing until I see the manifestation. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Amen, amen. Praise God. Thank you so much for your patience. I know we went kind of long here today, but uh, glory to God. Maybe I'll be a lot slower next or quicker next something next week. Praise God. <laughs> you can hope. That's all you can do. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate all your input and uh, your faith and your confidence in God. Go in the power of His might. Let's see some manifestation and show God's glory to this world. Amen. Yeah. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I won't see you before then.